Welcome to Nine Cents, a satanic perspective of our modern world. I'm your host, Adam Campbell. And if this is the first time you're joining us, what the fuck took you so long? And if it's not, uh, well, it's great to see you again. And either way, it's really great to have you. Um, I've got a really great show for you this week. First of all, in The Devil's Advocate, we're going to be talking about drugs. I don't like the drugs, but the drugs like me. A little bit of uh, Manson there for you. The Infernal Informant, I've got a great interview with Storm from Art on You Studios. And if you're tuning in specifically just for that, it's going to be about 15, maybe 20 minutes. So if you don't want to listen to me, tune back in then. But you're absolutely welcome to join me for the entirety. Also in Infernal Informant, I want to talk about Birthers. And in Creature Feature, the new show uh, from HBO, Game of Thrones. I'm also bringing in the sex fart. In Bizarre the Bizarre, I'm going to be talking about what I've alluded to in, I think, at least two shows so far. So, if you've ever wanted to hear me rant about that, uh, well, today's the day. I don't care how fucking tired I am, I'm going to be bringing it out. The sex fart. But, before we do that, how about I just, uh, I talk about my week a little bit. I just got a new microphone, and you might notice that I sound a little different. I hope I sound better. The last microphone I had was was quite old, and uh, when I got to the uh, screeching part of my voice, it would uh, get a lot of static. I'm hoping this is a lot uh, stronger of a mic, and though I may have to edit the volume and such, it should be a lot better, and it hopefully records interviews a lot better. Now, for the interview with Storm tonight... Uh, obviously it's pre-recorded, and it was the day before my new microphone got here. So, unfortunately, you're going to have to suffer through, again, um, not only really bad cell phone, uh, speaker phone, but with that mic recording it as well. Uh, next week, I do actually have an uh, interview with uh, writer-director Travis Sewer, and he was actually recorded with this new one uh, through Skype, this new microphone. So it's going to go a lot better. It sounds, a l- <laughs> it's like night and day, the quality. Um, so look forward to that from here on out. Um, uh, so that was the new microphone. I'm I'm really excited about it. So it, really, it, if it does sound a lot better, let me know. Just because. No fucking reason. Hiking. Everyone out there knows that I'm an avid hiker. I love getting out in the wilderness. I'm, you know, living in Utah, it's fantastic. Because quite literally, I have the mountains in my fucking backyard. So anytime I want during the weekends, which is every weekend we like to get up there and go out. But this week, motherfucker snowed all over us. From Friday fucking night when it was a little bit rainy and overcast to Saturday morning when we were going to hit Tempanogos for the first time this year. Just a fucking blanket of snow. Mother Nature can be a fucking bitch. It it really fucking sucks. And it ruined our entire weekend. However, today was really nice. Uh, I got out there and uh, spent some time in the yard, which it needed it, so it was all right. And that's sort of my zen time, my me time, if you know what I mean. Okay, like I said, I got the, the interviews done this week. Uh, thanks to the mic, it's going to go you know a lot better from here on out. And I met a new brewing friend this week. It's actually an old friend um, of my wife's husband. Uh, either way, he has been home brewing for years, and uh, I'm always looking to you know get one more person over here while we can uh, drink and brew. So I'm looking forward to that. It was really great seeing him again. And you know what? I'm just going to stop delaying, and we're going to get right into it. How about we uh, move on over? The Devil's Advocate. <laughs> We are the devil's I always preface this, not only with echoing fucking from my speakers here, I always preface the devil's advocate segment with uh, the following statement. A little disclaimer, if you will. I am a Satanist, I am a member of the Church of Satan, but I do not speak for the Church of Satan, so my commentary needs to be taken in that vein. The Church of Satan has a long, firm stance on drug use and drug abuse. It always has. But it's something that 
constantly creeps up from uh, not only new people um, learning about Satanism on their own, but um, just as sort of a, a worldview of, of Satanism as a whole. So today I really wanted to sort of uh, dive right in, uh, go to the Church of Satan website under um, Theory Practice, uh, and you're going to find the article there. Uh, Church, and Sarah, Church of Satan Policy on Drug Abuse is the title. Um, I'm not going to go through this line by line and talk about it. Um, I'll give you the Church of Satan stance and then sort of give you my opinions. Really, it's, it's pretty much the same fucking thing. Um, and the stance is like this. The Church of Satan does not condone any illegal activity. And that includes drugs. Pretty fucking easy, right? And it's, it's really one of those lines that is just as undeniably uh, just open and blatant as we don't harm animals or children. But people still fucking think we do because they're fucking retarded. And people think we condone drug use. And I, this is actually probably, um, you know, a, a residual belief from most of the quote-unquote magical groups that have cropped up since the dawn of time. Um, a lot of religions even have, have relied heavily on altering your reality through substance abuse. And maybe not necessarily abuse, but certainly use. You know, as a Satanist, we really take it as this is our only life. This is all we got. We're going to fucking make the best of it. This is either our own version of heaven or hell, depending on our actions and how we control the world around us. So why would we go out of our way to become slaves to something else? We certainly don't do it for someone else, and certainly not invisible someones out there. So why would we do it for a substance? Now, it's important to note that this really is, you know, the Church of Satan's policy falls on illegal drugs. Um, and that's because, you know, that old saying, uh, responsibility to the responsible. We, and, and I've said this many times on earlier shows, we follow the laws uh, of the societies in which we live. We always have. You know, we respect that. Because without that, um, chances are we're going to fall right back to those <laughs> witch burnings or uh, 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 just where anyone who didn't conform with the majority was killed. And uh, quite frankly, that's detrimental to us. We are the alien elite. Uh, by definition, we are not in the majority, nor do we want to be part of the herd. Um, so, you know, in order to maintain our, our way of life, we have to obey the, the laws, um, and we have to respect them. You know, you may not agree with them, but there are ways to go about changing laws. Um, now, there is also a note here um, to be discussed a bit, because not only illegal drugs can be used and abused, there are clear-cut consequences for that. As a, a, a human adult and as a uh, Satanist, you have to be aware of the consequences of any action, no matter what it is. So even if it's not an illegal drug, there are going to be certain consequences or pharmaceutical side effects of anything you take. It, you know, it's your responsibility to understand those, weigh the benefits uh, uh, against the consequences, and make an informed decision on whether you use prescription drugs prescribed through a doctor or um, over-the-counter drugs. Certainly no one is saying that you should be some holistic, new world drug user. Um, but if, if the society that you live in condones, say, marijuana use for certain ailments, be it up until cancer, well then, if it's legal and it alleviates the symptoms, use it. But don't abuse it. And, and certainly don't abuse any drug. And I actually wanted to step on this a little bit earlier um, ago, and I, I sort of went off on a little rant there about responsibility. Abusing drugs, whether it's illegal or not, is a bad thing. Certainly alcohol, one that uh, you know is, is really at my back door, if you don't keep a bit of self-control, um, you can easily be swallowed by the the 
item that you're you're taking in to your body. Uh, so, you know, even if marijuana is legal, it certainly clouds your mind when you're on it, and it certainly clouds your judgment. So, you know, if it's legal and you use it, fine, but understand that there's limits to that. And that goes for alcohol, that goes for cigarettes, that literally goes for everything, even fucking um, prescription drugs. So that's the stance the Church of Satan takes on it. If it's illegal, they don't condone it. You're an adult. It is your decision whether or not you do it. And if you do, prepare to be caught and to pay the consequences. Church of Satan has no liability there. So that's the Church of Satan's stance on it. Let's go ahead and move on over to, um, well, the Infernal Informant. Before I go, if you want to read the actual article, it's it's really fucking good. You should check it out at the Church of Satan website, as mentioned before. Um, and really, if you want to know anything about Satanism, that's the first place you should head into. A lot of people go to message boards online, or they go to Facebook communities and such, and they ask a lot of questions that are really point-blank answered if you just buy the Satanic Bible, or you just go to the fucking website. It's really simple. It's really easy. There's no reason not to, except for laziness or ignorance. And you can't claim ignorance anymore. So don't be fucking lazy. Alright, so that's enough of my ranting. Uh, the Infernal Informant's up next. Warriors of darkness, earthquakes, volcanoes, the dead rising from the grave, human sacrifice, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria, all in the infernal informant. I actually want to preface this interview a little bit, if I may. Um, like I mentioned before at the very beginning, this was uh, recorded with my phone and the old microphone. So, it's not really great quality. And, you know, just keep that in mind. Uh, you can still understand everything. Uh, well, at least I could, <laughs> so I'm hoping you can. Um, and it's really important information. If you're in the Salt Lake area, certainly go check it out next weekend at uh, Art on You Studios. Um, and let's go ahead and move on to the interview, shall we? Welcome to Infernal Informant. This week, we'll begin with, hopefully, the first of a two-part interview with none other than Storm of Art on You Studios, located at 8971 West, 2700 South, Magna, Utah. Thank you so much for joining me, Storm. I wanted to have you on for a couple of reasons. Um, one, I was hoping to learn more about the Paw Print Inkathon you're hosting in your studio, and two, I want to let my listeners know what other Satanists out there in the world are doing. So, I appreciate you having me on, Adam. That's, that's just awesome, and I was thrilled to not only uh, go find you to uh, match your frost venue, uh, the other craft, but then once we started networking and getting together on Facebook, I think it's just awesome that we're all out here in Utah and trying to make these connections, and then you have me on the show. So thank you for, for doing this. Hey, right on. Yeah, it's always a trip. I, for the longest time, I'd known there, were, there had to be at least hundreds of, of Satanists in Utah, uh, but you know, growing up here in such a, I would like to say, or, or I would like to see it as a religiously oppressive environment, you just always assume you're the only one, so you're always sort of uh, outcast and everything, so whenever you get an opportunity to meet another Satanist, it's, uh, well in my opinion, it's it's probably the best thing you can fucking do in the, in the community, so uh, it, it's truly a pleasure, and uh, and like I said, I, I understand that you are a, a very busy man and uh, you taking the time out of your uh, busy schedule to uh, meet with me here. Uh, well, uh, you know, it's not lost on me. I really do appreciate it. Not at all. Uh, it really, it's a matter of trying to schedule it in. I love to do this kind of stuff, and especially given it for, for another fellow member. Like I said, I thought it was great uh, in the beginning, given what I do for a living, and allows me the liberty to be able to be a little bit more open, uh, you know, about uh, being, being a member of the COS and, and our philosophy. So it was nice when we were able to, uh, to sort of let that out. And then I met Brad, uh, who's a, another one of us out here, and he started getting tattooed by me. Like, he's got Dr. LeBay's portrait on him that I've done, like King Diamond's portrait that I've done on him. And we had an open dialogue. And I met another friend who, uh, you know, said, I'm a Satanist also, and I thought, well, that's fantastic, now there's more of us networking. Then we started uh, hanging out with another couple, and we regularly double date with, and uh, they're also uh, one of us, and then you know, we hooked up with Jason, who uh, produced a show that I was on earlier this year, and Vegas Gilmore. 
part with with a part of that show. So it, it, it's become very neat to have all these people come together and see that you know, we're up here in Utah, and it might be a little ironic to a lot of people, but there, there's a large group of us out here that are probably networking and, and getting together doing some cool stuff. Oh, yeah. So uh, more uh, focused here on the, on the Paw Print Inkathon. Can you tell me a little about what this event is about? Yeah, you bet. The Inkathon, we decided to do it after doing the philanthropy event last year. Uh, we thought that uh, it would be great to do a philanthropy event, and we had decided to do uh, the Huntsman Cancer Institute last year. One of the artists was a part of our staff. Uh, his wife was a survivor, and he suggested that we do it, so we decided, you know what, I think almost all of us either know someone very close to us, or have known someone that either survived or unfortunately didn't survive cancer, so we thought that would be a great one to do, and we were able to raise $3,399 for the research department of the Huntsman Institute with only three artists doing the ribbons. Wow, very this, cool. This year, yeah, it was you have to really neat feeling when you do something like that. It's pretty cool. So this year we just said we want to do it again, but given that we're all animal lovers, the current staff that we have, we are all really passionate about animals. And you know, my wife is really fostering kittens. Uh, Haley, one of our other artists, she is, you know, specializes in animal portraiture and is huge with the thin pins. Uh, one of our other artists, Adam, he, he would carry his dog around like Paris Hilton through the, even while he's tattooed if he could. Oh, jeez. So, you know, everybody in there had this just passion about animals. We decided we're going to the Humane Society. And what we're doing is little paw prints. They're going to be on two inches in diameter. They're $20 a piece. And my ongoing joke is that you will get the choice of black or dark black. <laughs> and, which, which in other words, you get, you get black. Yeah. And there, there should be solid paw prints. And every last penny will be donated to the Humane Society. That's very cool. So, does the Humane Society know that you're doing this? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Of course, any time that we're going to do a charity event, we approach the, the charity of our choice first and let them know that we'd like to do it and how we want to set it up. And I think the great reaction is to watch when they say, wow, how unique. You're going to do tattoos to raise money for us. Yeah, it's not really something that's common. Yeah. So it's, it's a lot of fun, and in fact, the response has been fantastic. We only get almost everything donated as, as far as supplies and ink and all that good stuff. And we've even got three artists from the, uh, within the valley from different shops are going to come and donate their time to help us do it. Gosh, you, you got to love that when the, the, the community really comes together. And, you know, for, for a cause that people believe in, it, 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 it's really important. So... Um, when is this happening, first of all? It's going to be happening Saturday, May 7th, so one week after Walt Burger's uh, it's going to be the event, and it's going to be our shop from 10 a.m. until 8 p.m., and it's going to be on a first-come, first-served basis, so there's no uh, reservations or appointments that are going to be made. You're just going to have to stand in line and bear the elements, rain or shine, and get your get bought for it. Oh, yeah. Uh, what do you personally hope to... Uh, be the outcome of this event? I would like to see that we're able to raise at least as much money as we did for the hospital last year. So if we're able to get close to that $3,400 range, I think that would be fantastic. That'd get a lot of blankets, a lot of food, uh, ultimately get, get some pets that need uh, some, some good home. And I think that's what's most important to us, is that you know, we're thinking about our familiars out there. And especially being Satanists, I mean, that's huge with us. And, uh, you know, I want to see these pets get some great homes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what what do you think inspired this event for you? I think, you know, like I said before, I think what mainly inspired it was our passion for animals. Renee, you know, my wife has been doing the fostering for a couple of years now, and I think she's fostered well over 100 kittens in the town. And like I said, uh, with Haley, you know, she's huge with the animals. Uh, Tim one of our artists, he's real passionate with, with his dog and Adam, you know, everybody in there can easily tell you just how passionate and loving toward the animals they are. In fact, we just hired a piercer today and he's a huge animal rights activist. So, and to have that kind of staff and to have those kind of people working for you, it was easy to, to choose the Humane Society. Gosh, that's 
I, I absolutely love that. Um, well, I, my wife and I are certainly going to be out there to help support your your event uh, for <laughs> for whatever, however it counts. You know, I mean, we're going to definitely uh, donate the money. Uh, we think it's an event certainly worth holding. And uh, you know, if, if anyone listening is out there in uh, Salt Lake City County or um, Salt Lake County or you know anywhere else in Utah that you'd be willing to drive, you should absolutely come in and support. Uh, support this cause. It's uh, you know it's it's near and dear to the the, the satanic uh, certainly the satanic society um, that that we're really evolving into. And you know th- what's so fascinating about this for me at least is that we have such a shitty uh, stereotype associated with us, perpetuated by some really horrible people. Um, but events like this really shake loose those, uh, you know, that idea associated with us that it, it not only promotes, you know, the benefit of, uh, you know, our, our familiars and our friends on the fuzzy side of the world, but uh, it, it also really, it, it benefits us in the long run as well. So, uh, you know, and I, I couldn't stand behind you more. I think this is just absolutely fantastic. Um, yeah, it, 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 it's not just following one of the tenets of our philosophy that uh, you know, we view it, it, that sometimes we're better, but most often worse than those that walk on all fours. But you know, just knowing that it's, it's considered one of our cardinal sins to bring any sort of harm to, to animals. Yeah, and so you know, this is a, this is a way for us to really go out there and say, not only do we avoid harming animals, but we do anything we can to put them up on a pedestal. You know, they, they truly are our familiars. They're like children to us. And we treat them as such. You know, I, I know that the hair is one around me right now. She's our bangle. <laughs> and I, you know, I absolutely adore her. And I, I you know, she is like another daughter to me. So, so, it, so is Lily and so is so Lynn. Well, so uh, how long have you had an affinity for animals? Since I was a child. I mean, since I can remember, I've always loved animals. I remember the first puppy that we had, I think, Mocha, she was a Cocker Spaniel. I remember all of my cats. Uh, throughout my years, I, I've been raised by cat people, so now I'm, I'm quite the cat person in my adult years. I have pictures of my cats eating my boots at the shop, and I post them online when I get a chance, and I think it's fantastic that I met someone else who is equally as passionate about uh, that's awesome yeah I, I was personally raised with dogs um and i mean i would remember camping out at night uh, in in the dog house with my dogs just you know spending as much time I mean, they literally were my best friends uh i mean partially because i was outcast from the rest of uh my uh, youthful uh, human society, but, you know, they just, they were always there for me whenever I needed them, so, you know, I spent as much time as I possibly could with them, so I, I absolutely understand that. Um, and I kid you not, they talk to you. You can say, you know, it's, it's weird that you're carrying a conversation with your animal, but my cat talks back to me. <laughs> and, 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 you know, they, they call me a little weird or bizarre, but I kid you not, I, I know what she's saying to me. That's if cool. I'll, 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 say, I'll, say, I'll say, I know when she wants my jacket because she wants to lay in it. I know when, you know, she has whatever need it is, and, and I'm able to, to help her out. And she does the same for me. She, she has this unconditional love that you can't help but just feel good when, you know, Lily or Stella or Sahara comes up and, like, she's right now coming to sit on my lap, and, you know, they, they make you feel good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that so are there going to be representatives from the Humane Society um, maybe helping people uh, be paired with animals there? I don't know that uh, they're going to be out there with any sort of animals or anything like that, especially given that we really can't have animals in the shop. And yeah, not in it, absolutely. Uh, around, the ta- around the tattoo process, because you're talking about modifying skin, there's blood involved and that sort of thing, so you can't have the, the dander and that sort of thing around. And... Uh, there, there may be the possibility, even though there are people that support it, that still have allergies to, to specific animals. They may be all right with, with kids that may have an allergy to dogs. So we can't have a bunch of animals around at the shop. So that, that means that I can't say they're going to have 
anything set up out there. However, we do know that their representatives need to say they're definitely coming out to get palm prints. They're nice. supporting it that way. And I've also heard that they've been sending out text messages. They've got on their Facebook page. I believe that they're going to be putting uh, a copy of the poster ad in City Weekly. And I've also heard that they're going to try and get uh, a little shout out on Fox News. Oh, uh, yeah. So you know, they're def- yeah. They definitely are happy that this is happening, that we're giving support. So they're doing all they can to help us have the most successful event possible. That's just, that's absolutely fantastic. Well, uh, look, Storm, I, I really appreciate again your time um, talking with sure, me today yeah. about this. And uh, once again, anyone that's in the uh, Utah uh, area or, you know, just the Salt Lake uh, County area, Check out uh, Art on You Studios at 8971 West, 2700 South on May 7th from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, for the Paw Print Inkathon, the immune side of Utah. Uh, it's for a fantastic cause, and uh, you know you absolutely just uh, must support not only fellow Satanists but uh, your uh, furry friends out there because uh, you know they they just help make our lives as uh, colorful and uh, wonderful as they are. If people need more information, those, those are other people need more information, they can also check us out on our Facebook page, which is facebook.com forward slash art on you studios. And it has complete information there with a poster, and if they have any questions, they can post on our wall, and we'll be happy to answer for them. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and is, is that the best way to get a hold of you for this? I think the best way to find be calls direct at the shop. Uh, our shop number is 801-981-8180. Otherwise, yeah, the Facebook page is that, you know, that online community has grown to a height that has now become its own little small country. <laughs> um, so it's, it's huge and we use it a lot. And people that want to contact us through that venue are more than welcome to and we will definitely get the question answered. Fantastic. Well, I got to say, I, I would definitely like to know the outcome of the event. Uh, would you be willing to return to the show for the results and to talk about what you learned? Absolutely. By that point, we'll be in a fantastic position as far as our expansion, and the event will be over. Things will definitely calm down. But I would love to set the time and be on your show again. I, and I can't say how much I appreciate being a part of your show. I think it's fantastic. Great. All right, so we are absolutely going to have a follow-up show after the uh, 7th of May uh, on this Pop Ring Inkathon uh, to let all of you know how it went. But really, you should know how it went because you're going to fucking be there, right? Right. That, that was weird. I like this uh, repeat there. I don't know what the fuck happened in the editing. I, I swear I caught all that shit, but obviously not. So sorry about that. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and move on to the next uh, article here. Uh, this is from CNN Politics by Alan Silverlieb, uh, posted on April 28th. And it's the birther movement immune to facts. I have long avoided this issue because I think it's so absurd. You know, like anyone else, I really appreciate, for what they are, conspiracy theories. And I don't take my position as a full-fledged supporter of Obama, because I'm not. He was actually my third choice for president when um, the the primaries were going on. And he has really not gone through with what I had uh, believed him uh, to go through with as far as um, progressive politics are concerned. Um, I've actually been really disappointed with him, to be quite honest. So I'm not coming at this as, you know, a Kool-Aid fucking drinker here. And I'm certainly not one of those Republicans like the birthers who defends them or is so casual about it as to not affiliate themselves with them, but say, well, if the president says it, I take him at his word. You know, that sort of asshole backhanded insult way of, <laughs> of confirming that you don't believe he's a birther or you know that it aids your political agenda by saying that. Uh, it's only now that I bring it up because I think the idea in this article parallels not only the birther movement um, but any political or religious movement and certainly um, the ideas that 
sort of stay with Satanism that we've discussed earlier in this show and in the interviews, the negative connotations that, that are associated with Satanism that just aren't fucking true. And, you know, people are just immune to facts. Immune, immune to facts. So let's go ahead and uh, get into this article, shall we? Uh, can the birthers ever be convinced that Barack Obama was born in America and is eligible to serve as president? Probably not, according to one prominent psychology professor and other political observers. Since Obama launched his bid for the White House, a sizable minority of Americans has expressed strong doubts about whether he was actually born in the United States. Over the past few years, the allegation that he was born overseas in Kenya, or perhaps Indonesia, has taken on a life of its own, despite a mountain of evidence to the contrary. A recent CNN Opinion Research Corp poll showed that roughly 25% of Americans including over 4 in 10 Republicans, believe Obama was definitely or probably not born in the United States. Earlier this week, CNN released the results of its own investigation into the controversy. Documents and statements from numerous public officials and childhood friends made clear that the president was born in Hawaii on August 4, 1961. On Wednesday, Obama himself addressed the issue, pleading for an end to the distraction of sideshows and carnival barkers. That was probably one of his many fucking mistakes in addressing this. You know, you could have had a White House aide release your fucking birth certificate and talk about how foolish it was. But for you, the president, to go out of your way to fucking address it directly, you know, a a lot of people respect and appreciate that. I think politically it was a stupid fucking maneuver. But it's only one in a long line of Obama stupid fucking maneuvers. This guy bends to fucking Republican talking points more than anyone I have ever seen in my lifetime. And and it's really aggravating when you expected someone with uh, a really strong persona um, to be so fucking weak. And especially when there's real-time consequences to that, when we're trying to fucking get out of this goddamn economic crisis that we're still fucking trudging through. The president yielded to demands from his critics that he released his original long-form birth certificate, filing a special legal request with Hawaiian authorities to release a document that's no longer used for official purposes and ordinarily remains buried in the basement archives of the state health department. Obama's 2008 release of the more common live birth certification, a short computer-generated form typically used for documentation purposes, did little to silence the chorus of skeptics. It remains to be seen whether Wednesday's release will be received any differently, but the early reaction wasn't exactly positive. One of the main websites pushing the birther claims, guess what it is, birthers.org, declared that forgery or not, now we can debate the true meaning of a natural-born citizen. So, he proves that he was born in the country, and now we have to figure out what that really means. He's just, truth doesn't fucking matter. You can look right there and know that he's a fucking citizen. So, okay, what about this? Their argument stands that if he was born in another country and his parent was not, one of his parents was um, not uh, an active citizen, then he's a dual citizen and not a natural born citizen. So, you know, the controversy will continue, and it's probably going to be seen on every fucking cable news media outlet, because real problems that we're facing aren't interesting and polarizing enough, apparently, that we have to continually talk about shit like this. It's really frustrating, because we have some genuine problems in this country. Um, And I think the biggest... Um, problems that we have are within our own fucking borders. Um, so to, to really focus on this, I mean, it, it does a couple things. One, it diverts attention from this coming election and the realities of, of what it means as an outcome, um, but also from you know the vast array of conflicts and wars that we are currently fucking knee-deep in. And the fact that we still have soldiers dying on a daily basis. Our fucking brothers and sisters and sons and daughters. What the fuck? But hey, you know, let's talk about how the birth certificate doesn't say what you want it to say on the top, even though it's okay for uh, Congress and it's okay for um, uh, the the legislation and uh, 
It's just fucking retarded. All right, you know, I'm, I'm going to continue this because we're almost fucking done here. Um, why the unrelenting skepticism? Emory University's Drew Western, I'm sorry, Weston, author of The Political Brain and an informal advisor to Obama's 2008 campaign, chalked up much of it to Obama's reluctance to immediately rebuke the charges more quickly in the presidential race. Quote, the right wing has attempted to make him one of them as opposed to one of us, he claimed. Weston, a professor of <clears throat> excuse me, psychology and psychiatry, cited where psychologists call the sleeper effect. If you present negative information about someone and it initially goes unchallenged, you might alter some people's conscious beliefs by challenging it later, he asserts. But they are left with a negative gut-level feeling that doesn't go away. Political feelings, once they are strongly held, tend to be resistant to facts. And it's not just political feelings, but I think this is interesting nonetheless. It's just the result of the way our brains work, he says. Weston mentioned the so-called swift boat attacks against Democratic presidential nominee John Kerry in 04, which called into question the senator's service in Vietnam. Kerry allowed his honor to be challenged and didn't respond for weeks, Weston said. When finally he did respond and had a def definitive evidence that the attacks were untrue, it was too late. People's feelings toward him had already changed, and they wouldn't change back. go back on the point. Along similar lines, Weston told CNN that if staunch Democrats or Republicans are presented with clear evidence of wrongdoing on the part of their party's nominee shortly before an election, they'll come up with every kind of rationaliz rationalization to explain it away. We fight off innervation... Excuse me. We fight off information that makes us feel bad and gravitate toward information that makes us comfortable, he says. Weston also brought up the explosive issue of race, one of the biggest political lightning rods in U.S. history. He insisted the birther movement never would have taken hold with a white president. It's not fair to call a large segment of today's electorate the 1950s style racist, he said, but some of the people are unconsciously prejudiced in a way that predisposes them to not believing that a black man with a funny name could have really legitimately, uh, could really had been legitimately elected as president of the United States. But Bill Mayer, a Northeastern university political scientist took issue with the notion of race as the uh, critical component of the birther movement. Quote, the fact that Obama is black may affect the form of the conspiracy, but probably not the fact that there is a following for this rumor, he told CNN. Conspiracy beliefs have long history in American politics. Mayer cited a range of political conspiracy theories, including claims regarding the Kennedy assassination, involvement in the part of the Clintons in alleged murders, and George W. Bush's supposed knowledge of the 9-11 terror attacks. Presidential historian Douglas Brinkley noted that back in the 19th century, questions were raised over the American roots of Andrew Jackson and Chester Arthur, but it was nothing like this, he told CNN. We are now in an age of electronic journalism. This has become a ghastly scenario over the last month. Uh, Mayer suggested that Obama's release of the long-form birth certificate will further marginalize those who insist the matter of birth is open to question. Still, he added, I don't understand why the White House took so long to put out the document. Just how long was controversy drag on? Weston claimed the uh, birther issue will continue to be political father, I'm sorry, fodder, until a critical mass of Republican leaders decide it's making the GOP look foolish and hurting the party among independent voters. A spokesman for House Speaker John Boehner, Republican Ohio, released a statement Wednesday claiming that the controversy, quote, has long been a settled issue, end quote. History suggests otherwise. Um, and Republicans are already backing away from this as fast as they can. Uh, even cable news is backing away from it. Even Fox is backing away from it. We'll see how much party, I'm, I'm sorry, how much power the Tea Party has in this upcoming election because it looks, certainly from the coverage that we've seen, admittedly colored coverage, that they are really the spearmen of, of this controversy on the birther issue. Personally, I think Obama is going to get elected another term, probably not for the betterment of, of our country. You know, I just have a real hard time saying that I'm going to fucking vote for him again when he really disappointed me the way he did. Um, but none of the Republican candidates that have sent out exploratory uh, commissions or uh, groups are worth looking at seriously. They're all fucking jokers. 
Um, I mean, some of them are just doing it for uh, hyping their own fucking um, shows that they have on TV. So, you know, we'll have to see as it gets closer what the reality of this is. But I thought that was interesting. And like I said before, I thought it was interesting because it parallels a couple things. You know, the truth that people are presented with doesn't really stick um, if, if they are backed by strong political or religious ideas of it um, prior to that proof. So as shitty as it is, we are going to be connected with um, abuse of children and animals no matter what, no matter how many people know the fucking truth. Uh, it's just something that, you know, we're going to have to shake off as whenever we're hit with it and, uh, you know, tell the fucking truth if anyone ever brings it up. But it's going to be out there. All right, that's all for the Infernal Informant. Thank you for sticking with me through that. I know that was a long ar uh, article, and it was a lot of me sort of bullshitting on it. Um, we've got the Creature Feature and then uh, Bizarre the Bizarre coming up. So I hope you will stick with me for a little bit longer. The sky is dark, moon piercing the night. Through the trees, the damsel in distress comes, breaking through the underbrush. Fear! painted on her face. The darkness hunting her is near. She the swamp, water slowing her escape. The creature nears, the damsel turns, hands rising to her sides as her last is effort to thrust the creature back. Welcome to Creature Feature. Thanks for joining me for Creature Feature. I appreciate it. Today we're going to be talking about the HBO series that just started, I think uh, tonight actually, is the third episode, Game of Thrones. Um, it's an American medieval fantasy television show. Uh, it was actually filmed primarily in, um, excuse me, in Malta and uh, Belfast, Northern Ireland. This is actually a series that is based off of our author uh, George R. R. Martin's best-selling a Song of Ice and Fire series, and he has a plan seven fantasy novels. And HBO is pretty much doing one novel, or at least at this point they're projecting that they're going to try to do one novel per season. And the author has said that the the script that he has seen for the pilot um, and for the episodes so far have have followed along and been true to the the novel um, quite well. This actually came out, um, and I didn't see the first episode, I think, for almost a week after it came out, um, to huge acclaim. Like, like people lost their shit. And, it, like, in some stations over in Europe, it got the highest ratings of any show ever. So that's pretty testament, uh, good testament on a, a solid HBO series. And, you know, ever since The Sopranos, I've had a hard time finding bad HBO series. And I actually wasn't initially interested in this um, because, you know, when people recommend stuff to me that I've, I've never been exposed to, I'm always a little bit negative. So I, I have some of that, I guess you could call it a birther movement, <laughs> uh, resistance to, <laughs> to uh, suggestion. Um, it's just part of who I am. But boy, was I fucking wrong to think that. It is, and, and this is why I like it. It's it's not like this high fantasy like dwarves and elves and goblins or whatever um, at all. It, it's really more of a political drama um, with conspiracy and um, intrigue. And uh, it just happens to be set in a um, more medieval world. Uh, certainly not a fantasy world as I would accept it. It's not just the typical, you know, sword and shield and armor type thing either, though there is quite a bit of that. Um, there's also really great writing, for one. But, you know, they have different, um, already in just two episodes I've seen that have been released, um, they have different uh, uh, cultures that are well thought of. There's actually languages. A specialist was pulled in for the show to create the language. There's like 1,800 different words in this for the show to be tailored for it. So I hope it doesn't end up like some weird Avatar thing, you know, where you have the director up there accepting an award speaking in that fucking language that he met, made up, which was really retarded, just to throw that out there. Uh, Cameron, you're a fucking moron uh, for that. But... This is a testament to how they really are spending the money to make this 
a quality visual show and a quality depth show. Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, certainly check it out. Um, I'm sure you can find it on demand or uh, anywhere where they sell uh, TV shows like like iTunes or something like that. So the movie's called, or the series is called Game of Thrones. It's on HBO Sunday nights. Check it out. It's absolutely worth it. Let's go ahead and round off the show with a uh, little Bizarre of the Bizarre. Um, <laughs> I told you there's a three-step program coming in here. Um, and I, I hope you uh, enjoy the absurdity of it. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the bazaar of the bazaar. <laughs> the sex part. Now, this is not something that anyone wants to happen. But certainly if you've had sex more than, say, three times... Um, it may or may not have cropped up, but it will eventually. And what I'm talking about is the accidental slip <laughs> while you're in the process uh, or, or otherwise engaged in the making of the love. <laughs> so, you <laughs> you know, it, it could be from, from what you ate earlier in the day. It could be whatever. Um, but you're just in the middle of something and then, beep, slip, oops, tee it happens. And how do you deal with that? You know, you can absolutely take it a couple ways. You can ignore it and hope that the person you're engaged with is not going to mention it. You can both giggle and laugh about it and sort of work through that awkwardness and, and keep going. Um, but then there's always that threat of the stench. You know, for me, you know, when you're engaged in, in sex and, and you're just wanting to uh, really enjoy the moment... Everything comes into play. So it's not just thinking about what I'm doing or what I'm going to do or what I want to do or what I want them to do to me. Um, and it's not just the sight of, of seeing the skin and the flesh and uh, the goosebumps and everything like that. And it's certainly not just the smells because the smells are fucking fantastic um, during sex. Until you do that. And then suddenly you're kicked out a step. Or at least I am kicked out a step. So you have to sort of course correct a little bit. <laughs> and it seems like the older I get, the harder it gets to course correct. <laughs> and for those of you who are a little bit older in the audience, you might understand what I'm saying. At least I hope you do. Okay, so the three-step process to dealing with the sex part. Here it is. Take notes, or just fucking play this back <laughs> for a laugh uh, next time you have the opportunity. You want to move your ass as far away while still staying in the act of making the love as possible from the other person's face. So if you're getting a blowjob, ease off on it maybe a little bit. Try a little something else. Switch up the routine a little bit. But you want to move it away because the last thing you want to do is uh, really uh, break wind in someone's fucking chin. I mean... <laughs> One, it's really fucking rude. Uh, two, it's, they're never going to forgive you, and that's going to end that session and probably a couple of sessions that might have happened after it. Um, but it's just not something that you want to take a bite out of from two inches away. You know, you know what I mean? So get the fucking distance that you need. You got to fucking do it. And then maybe... You can make some other noise or otherwise cloud the senses. Maybe you just inspired to make out with them uh, heavily for a moment. <laughs> or, or maybe you want to bury their face in a pillow or something, which will probably help with the last step as well. But you just want to make sure that they aren't thinking of anything except for, wow, I am overcome with passion of my partner at this moment. He must really be into me. All the while they have no idea that all you're really into is trying not to make a scene. And three, the last step in this three-step process, slowly, slowly, and actually this falls back to an earlier episode when I talked about kegling, because this may help <laughs> with, with this third step here. As quietly as possible, slowly release it out. So if you need to throw some covers over yourself or something, just keep engaging their face and their mind with something else and just slowly ease it out and hope, hope, that that decision to have an entire can of fucking beans for lunch won't come back to bite you in the ass. <laughs> so, or you know what? You could just ignore the three steps and just let it rip and laugh about it and, and move through it. 
<laughs> that actually might be the better way. But if you don't want to do that, there's a three-step process for you, straight from Nine Cents. Um, and you know what? That's it for yet another wonderfully wicked Nine Cents. Um, what I didn't mention in the top of the show that I wanted to mention was yesterday was Valpurgis Noct. A lot of people did a lot of really great rituals. Um, a lot of people just enjoyed it with their family. Uh, and however you enjoyed it. You know, it's really the birthday of the Church of Satan. So at least if for nothing else is done, uh, take a second and just think about it and, and, and what that means. I know personally, I think I would be a wholly different person. I would still think the same way. But my aesthetics wouldn't be the same, I don't think. Um, you know, and maybe even uh, the way I address my beliefs would be different. Um, so, you know what? Just for a second, uh, thank you very much, um, the late and great Dr. Anton Zandelevay, uh, for providing us with this priceless gift of the Church of Satan. It's changed all of our lives in so many wonderful ways that you really can't do it justice by just saying thank you, but still, thank you. And uh, for all of you out there, members of the Church of Satan, uh, we have a lot of great things coming down the line for us. Uh, you know what? Stay fucking proud and stay productive and march forward as you always have done for the 45 years. And let's make this coming year one of the fucking best. Uh, hail Satan, man. All right, so like I said, uh, that's it for another show. I hope you enjoyed it. I'd love to hear from you. You can visit my website at 9centspodcast.com where I stream live every Sunday night at 9 o'clock um, Mountain Time. You can also check it on Ustream uh, just by clicking on the video um, on 9centspodcast.com. And you can also check me out on Facebook, uh, 9 Cents. Just search it, Facebook slash 9 Cents. Uh, if you want to get in contact with me, Certainly send me all any emails you want. If you want to tell me how fucked up I am, or how shitty this show is, or maybe how much you enjoy it for some crazy fucking reason, info at 9centspodcast.com. And you know what? If you are getting this via... Goddamn, excuse me. If you are getting this via uh, iTunes, I suggest you uh, leave a comment. Um, you know what? I will credit you for whatever you say, even if it's terrible. I appreciate criticism. Honesty, for me, is always the best. Um, even if it hurts a little bit. I don't mind. Monday nights are when I release the the podcast through RSS or XML feed. Um, that's when you're going to be able to get it through iTunes. If you'd like to learn more about the Church of Satan, churchofsatan.com is the place to go. If you'd like to meet other Satanists, try Undercroft at satannet.com. There's also a great message board, Letters to the Devil. Um, and if you want to hear other fine satanic voices and a plethora of, of really ex ex excellent fucking shows by other Satanists for your listening pleasure, uh, check out RadioFreeSatan.com. Um, and I'm hoping, fingers crossed, that we'll have something to announce there soon. And before I go, I would like to take a, a brief moment to highlight my children's book. If you didn't get it by yesterday... Um, you're going to have to pay full price. But you know what? It's okay because it's fucking worth it. Um, the full price version is a nice glossy cover finish. It has some extra character information at the tail end. And you can get an audio supplement uh, if you, by chance, for some crazy reason, want to hear me read it. Uh, you can also get wallpapers for any of your digital devices. The book is called How Crow Got a Scareback. Um, it is a children's book for a child audience. Um... You know, and it's just about finding strength within yourself. Something that, uh, you know, we don't need an invisible God for our children. All we need is to uh, let them know that they are quite capable and uh, they will do wonderful things in their lives. And I would like to think that this does that a little bit. So you can find How Crow Got a Scare Back by checking out the Facebook page of the same name or you can go to my website, adampcampbell.com forward slash crow. C R O W, and uh, you'll find out all the information there, and uh, some other suggested titles, and some other just sort of um, 
add-ons to the story. Once again, thank you for joining me. As always, I'm your host, Adam Campbell, and until next week, Hail Satan.